Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and those beyond the binary. This is The Between. Welcome. My name is Alex Rabitsky, and I will be the keeper of this gothic tale. My hunters may introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Wes Franks. I am the founder and creative director of Carrying Comfort Studios, and this evening I'll be playing the American Ross Fontenot. Hello, everyone. I'm Meg. I'm a DM's Guild author. And tonight for you, I will be playing the illustrious Carla Hulse, the Undeniable. Hi, my name is Jordan, or Upgrade and Moon in certain circles, and tonight I'm going to be playing the mother, the mad doctor, Cal Murdoch. Hi, my name is Shelby or Whistle. I'm just a regular TTRPG player here over on Twitch. And uh, tonight I'll be playing Hargrave, Ho Hargrave House's legacy, Pira Rivia. Very good. Um, we're going to get started here in just a moment, but first let's get some uh, pre-show announcements out of the way. First of all, uh, special thanks. We just got a donation right at the start of the stream here. So thank you for the $20. Very appreciated. Remember uh, to everybody out there, if you'd like to support what you're currently watching, we have a stream elements link down below. You can donate there that those proceeds go back to us, the performers, uh, or you can donate to our Kofi, which has... Um, uh, the, the proceeds from that go into just the, the general channel production fund. So it, we keep the lights on this way. It's how we make things. And I have plans and I want to make sure those plans happen. Um, and second of all, of course, as always, thank you to uh, Session Zero Clothing Apparel. Ryan, if you're watching or just I'm just going to put this out there in general, you're awesome. You're cool. You make good stuff. You can use promo code failsafe for 10% off your order. Um, I think that is everything at the start of the show here tonight. Uh, I'm excited. This is part two of our masquerade at Brathwaite Hall and Pira dealing with some shit. So we'll see where that goes. <laughs> um, Pira dealing with the shit part. What? We're also, at this point? yeah, uh, I, I, we're also getting pretty close to the end. I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little recap <clears throat> again, the start here once we return. But until then, let's go to our introduction and dive right into this week's chapter of the between. We will see you all shortly. So, previously, our Hunters of Hargrave House were dealing with a, uh, a, a couple of looming circumstances. The first of all being the upcoming Masquerade Ball being held by Theodora Brathwaite at her gargantuan estate in the countryside outside of London. The other issue was the matter of La Bella Hortensia Fig, who is still remaining at large. Um, we had three hunters decide to attend the uh, the masquerade, those being Ross, Carla, and the cow, and one, Pira, decided to stay behind and face off against the final fig during this night phase. Additionally, Pira uh, confronted her uncle Pavel um, and managed to get her uh, uh, the 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 left behind. Um, not left behind the the the, the dug necklace. up the necklace the yeah that was robbed from Demir's grave, um and returned to her, in addition to some just general exploits of continuing lines of investigation and we ended in the middle of uh the night phase so I believe we ended with. Uh, Theodora Brathwaite stepping out on a grand balcony, arriving at her own celebration, and announcing to the crowd, This will sure to be a night to remember. 
um and then we smash it away from that and we're going to go right back to our um unseen which as a reminder is a night of the grand guignol uh a play titled let me find it again uh the laboratory of hallucinations um as a quick recap because it's been a week this is a play about a scientist who discovers uh his uh lover is having an affair um let's see i think for this prompt this is the third prompt um we are going to i'm going to give this to I think I'll give this to Ross. Um, so if you could read prompt number three on the unseen, Wes, that would be great. You know, I don't know how to read. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> prompt number three. Describe act two in which the mad scientist kidnaps his wife's lover and uses an experimental technique to take over his mind. We see as... The stage rotates to its second panel. It's a little bit more decrepit in the laboratory, but it still looks like the semblance of a standard scientist's lab. We hear rustling, movement, dragging of what seems to be a sack on wood. A jingling of keys. A lock clicks and a door slams open as we see our protagonist dragging a sack that seems to be wriggling a bit. Just ever slightly, as if something drowsily is trying to escape from it. With strength that we did not expect, he draw draws the sack up and puts it on a table and unties it and unfurled like a birthday gift. The lover of our wife, of the wife of the play, is seen, drowsily trying to fight, grabbing for air, seeing things that are not, not truly there. The lights on stage shift from a pale blue to a sickly green, as we see our protagonist's face grimacing, grinning with delight. He starts expositing, talking about his processes and talking about how he's truly, truly, truly not mad at the man. He actually respects him. He believes that he was a worthy subject for his, his techniques and experiments. And he actually respects the gall that the man had to go after his own wife, his cherished beloved. And we see him bring out what we expected to be some sort of device, a, a head device or, a, or something like goggles of some sort. But no, it is just a needle with a substance that seems to be orange, matches the display of the, the stage around and takes his arm and says, now, don't bite your tongue off. You'll need that later. And injects him quickly with it. All right, very good. Thank you, sir. I think let's jump back over to the ball for a moment. I love Wes's unseen. Can we They're just so take a moment to appreciate Wes's unseen, please? Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. They're very good. Okay, so I'm a bad I'm a bad GM who forgot to double check uh what if we had any roles that needed to be resolved um at the end of last session, which I believe we do. Okay. I think um, everybody does. I think everybody I does. Hear. Well no, Pierre, yeah, Pierre got her thing resolved by tiptoeing through the shadows. Um I think I think I remember, but we'll just go one by one here and double check. It's been a hectic week, y'all. Um, Carla, you yes. were doing the the dance. You were yes. using your presence to 
insinuate yourself in a situation where um um you'd be kind of like a focus of attention yeah. can you remind remind uh, me what you were rolling I, for again i specifically was rolling a night move plus yep. presence yep, yep. with the intention that i wanted to try and get theodora as my dance partner yes and i believe I rolled, you yes i, I rolled uh, I'm either a 10 or 11, but I decided to bump it up to a 12 by putting on the mask of the past. Oh, that's right. You narrated that. Um, and I need to give you the extra benefit. So we'll narrate that. And then I believe wasn't wasn't Ross speaking with um, one of the Abernathy's was speaking with Cyrus. Indeed, I was trying to woo Cyrus. I was yes. trying to use my wiles and get some him. information from him. Or was that a day move or an information move? Uh, that was an. It, that was right. a. That was a. Yeah, that was an information. Information. Move. All right. And I believe you got clue with the complication. Uh, I did, we did not resolve it. We oh. did not resolve. Well, it. no. I mean, I think the role you got was a uh, was in that clue with the complication. We range. never. You never got my role. Oh. You never checked with oh. it. Yeah. So I was just gonna re-roll it. Okay. Uh, because That's a good idea. we got everybody else's role. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, that was that, like my bad. We got elbow deep into some Pira stuff. I wasn't yeah. going to interrupt it at all. It's oh, all okay. good. Well, I apologize. And then you go ahead and roll that, and I'll check with Cal. And your thing was, I believe, you, you were also doing the um, the counting. The uh, you, you were joining with uh, uh, Carla in that you were observing because you wanted to um, also sp I, speak with Theodore. I wanted to you? also speak with Brathwaite, but yes. uh, I, used, uh, I used reason with my role instead of presence. And do you remember what you got? I think I got an 11. Yeah, I think I, I, right? I remember, yeah, so okay. You both succeeded and we'll have that narrated in just a second. I want to resolve uh, Ross first since that was a little slip up on my end. Um, good. All right, so you had rolled information plus your presence. Mm hmm. Um, and that is, and I rolled, uh, so I got a five and a six, and I have a plus one presence that is exactly a 12. I mean, it's extremely fitting to get a mastermind clue at the mastermind's ball. I figured as much. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, you were ingratiating yourself with um, with Cyrus. Let's see. Okay, there's some good ones on here. I'm going to go with... You are speaking with Cyrus Abernathy, and I'll give you your uh, Watley camera clue first, and then we'll see about the mastermind clue, because, oh boy, we're... That brings us to 13. Oh boy. Um, so you're speaking to Cyrus, and, and he's just saying, hmm. You know, Mr. Fontenot, I believe our mutual friend is presently in attendance. You do? He's somewhere about, I'm certain. He wouldn't miss these functions, even though he is not always seen at one. Funny, after all, he does take after the sun, yet is seen only when he wishes to. I, on the other hand, he like gestures to his moon mask, freely display myself wherever I walk. But you know there is one thing I do not display, Mr. Fontenot. If you are so curious, perhaps of the thing I've already given to your friend, the Lady Holst, you might find this of particular interest. Uh, and he like reaches into like under the collar of his jacket and pulls out um, a pendant um, and he places it in your palm. It is a cinnabar pendant necklace with a broken clasp. Uh, they just like places in your into your palm for you. And he says, much like my mutual friend, Mr. Fontenot, I am quite fond of vagaries. While I do not wish for you to interrupt the goings-on of my society, I am intrigued, nonetheless, by your ability to work out the puzzle, as it were. Trust me, 
I will not stand in your way. I cannot speak for the other members of the society or even my wife. You have my confidence, but I'm intrigued to see if you, like so many others before, can be drawn down the path and survive the night. Um... Ross is going to stand and he's going to adjust his coat and while holding the pendant. Uh, he is then going to tilt, but not lift the mask so that it's looking up at Ross. That's going to look down at the man in the, ma the moon mask, uh, Cyrus. It's going to go, I've learned a thing or two from my compatriots and... Um, there's something that you must know about me, mister. I'm not one for walking into fire and coming out uh, unscathed, but I do come out one way or another. I'm intrigued to watch, and watch I shall. Enjoy the party, Mr. Fontenot. You as well. I'll be around. I love our talks. Um, you disappear, and as you kind of like you're moving through the crowd, you know you can hear Theodora's announcement on the nearby balcony, um, and there is a din of like conversation. Your your senses are heightened. You know mm -hmm. you got like you can hear conversation from across the room. You can smell champagne from like uh, different chambers through the house. Just it is a sensory experience and you hear different bits of rumor and gossip as these parties are wont to have. But an interesting thing catches your ear and this is the your mastermind clue. Uh, you hear um, there are discussions. There's there's a rumor going around right now that a one of there is somebody not in attendance tonight. Um, and it would seem that one of Theodora's social rivals has very recently fallen deathly ill. Interestingly, shortly after taking tea with her, not but uh, a few nights ago. Hmm. So there's your mastermind clue. Um, and I'll Don't jump over. Don't drink the tea! <laughs> She's smacking out someone's hand. Jumping over now to um, Carla and Cal. You two are doing this lovely two sides of the uh, uh, two sides of the same coin kind of dance Carla is a presence to be observed and respected and out there for all to see Cal you are subdued but because you both rolled very high you both get to narrate the results of this scene so after uh, Theodora gives this speech and begins to descend the stairs um, you both get to narrate what happens next so I'm gonna say you two take it away and narrate this however you would like. And then, Carla, you'll get an extra benefit from your 12. Can I interrupt just for a moment to yes. say thank you, Paradise Production, for the raid? Thank you for the raid. Yeah, those are my friends over there, so I just wanted oh, to call that out. Oh, very good. Hello. Welcome. Well, thank you. John, Shannon, love you. All, All right. right. So I think as the music starts up, and dance partners switch. Carla and Cal meet up just for a brief moment. And she whispers into his ear as the dance starts up. I think Tati is over by the buffet with a couple of her friends. Cal just kind of gives you a nod, uh, spins you, mm -hmm. and then hands you to someone else as he kind of meticulously makes his way through. And Carla again starts switching partners again and again and again until she meets a woman in sapphire gloves and a beautiful mask. Lady host, I've heard wondrous things about you. May yes, I? Of course, I, it would be my greatest honor. Enchanté. Enchanté. She'll take your hand. Continue. Mm -hmm. The two of them dance. It's cordial. It's polite. They're both very good dancers. In this moment, I think it's safe to say Theodora is probably leading. Mm -hmm. I think that's appropriate. 
She is older than Carla, at least in appearance. <laughs> and as they're dancing, Carla looks at Theodora. Well, I don't mean to be presumptuous. Presume no. away. <laughs> Very well, then. You seem to have taken a much greater interest in me and my friends recently. I don't mean, of course, to presume any mal malcontent. But, well, many, many sapphire things keep showing up around us, and I can't help but think that maybe we're being watched. Well, the temperatures do grow colder as the seasons pass from autumn to winter, and blue is, after all, a winter's color. Ah, a winter's color it may be, but the same shade? If I, why, if I were a more conspiratorial woman, I would dare say that you made everyone want to wear your colors this season. I like to set fashion trends from time to time, as I'm sure you've learned. Trust oh, yes. my words, Miss Host. I mean no direct malcontent towards you or any of the members of Hargrave House. I simply wish to test your mettle <laughs> and, well, Color me impressed thus far. <laughs> impressed indeed, I see, but you've sent our dear, dear Vivia something of interest. I see <sighs> that you've sent your servant to our quarters, and your dearest daughter seems to have done something quite, um... <sighs> Never Unique. mind Tati's oh, recent no. behavior. I assure you, as I informed your friend, I had no intention of allowing Dr. Murdoch to be harmed. Don't. I had no idea he would even be in attendance until, well, the night was already mostly done. Well, don't. Please do not mistake my inquiring for an accusation. <laughs> I don't really have anything personally against you, Lady Theodora. Rather, I think you're a very fascinating woman, a very fascinating woman to be up against. Thank you, my dear. I must say, I've given a look around. I'm disappointed to see the youngest Rivia is not in attendance. <sighs> Alas... The duties of Hargrave House are many, Indeed. and with three hunters well preoccupied with such social events, there are things that must be done in London, as it were. It's not a... it's not very often that we get social invites. Indeed. I'm so happy to have you here. I do suppose that is rather my fault for her current preoccupation. I assume she's wrapping up the last of those stray pigs. Something to that extent. Mm. There is still one sow that needs uh, resolving tonight. Mm, indeed. Um, ah, but don't let me keep you very long, my lady. Um, and here's the advantage I'm going to give you, and then we'll hear the rest of Cal's narration on this scene, uh, is, is she says, well, even without a Rivia here. She likes, she palms you something um, for that she pulls from the bosom of her dress. Mm -hmm. And she says, perhaps this evening can be more interesting still, should you and your friends find the time. And she will naturally let the dance mm -hmm. carry her away. She has palmed you a key to one of the private rooms of the house for you and your hunters to meet with her in private. Ooh. Fascinating. On this evening. Yes. Cal, take it away from here and narrate what happens next. Uh, is it all right if I move away from Theodora and move to Tati instead? All you said was Brathwaite, so I mean, I will uh, allow you to change <clears throat> your, your, your your focus a little bit. Yeah, I, I really like what you what you set up for there, Meg. So, mm -hmm. um, so we split off 
Cal kind of like makes it less gracefully, of course, because it, it is very uh, almost a little almost a little mechanical how he kind of moves through the crowd. Uh, he finds Tati and he uh, approaches her, you know, like the, the mask is on. So his his identity remains a bit hidden, uh, but he approaches her nonetheless. And he what mask is she wearing? I like the I like the idea of her kind of having like a blue and silver kind of accented thing where it's very much like like she has kind of like the mask of like a wolf. I was thinking wolf. Okay, we're on the same way. Like <clears throat> because good, you know good. Cal kind of has like the, the fox, fox going on, yeah. the fox and the wolf. Yeah. Um, but he approaches her. Miss Brathwaite, would you care for a dance? And he uh, he extends an arm to her uh, opposite to the you know to where she was shot mm. on the other side. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, you have the call here. You does she accept the dance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she accepts the dance. Okay. I take her. Uh, Cal takes her out, uh, and they they begin the the motions. Uh, Cal's footing is a little a little weird, a little uh, uneven. It's very clear that this man does not go out dancing often. Uh, but he begins by saying. Now, I must begin by apologizing for what happened yesterday morning. Oh, was it yesterday evening? Well, these hours seem to blend at this point. Do you know how much I'm really looking forward to putting a knife between your ribs later? I'm not entirely sure if you'll get the chance, but um, I've learned from my friends to, um, what was it, be and let be? You fucking shot me. You were going to shoot me. And you I shot didn't. many others. So therefore the scales are tipped in the opposite direction. Don't worry. I'll write them. Hmm. Well, uh, I was hoping to at least extend a hand of friendship. Or maybe even a question of... Why me? Why Hargrave House in general? Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Okay. Um, how do you think she responds? I'll, I'll, I'll roll back. I mean, like, in general, what kind of... How do you think her answer is conveyed, since you have narrative control of the scene here? Do you think she's more, like, forthcoming, or is she more, like, still aggressive, or whatever you can come to think of? Can I make a roll to see what kind of answer this would be? Whether or not it's coy, or if it's open um i i i see let's avoid a roll let's flip a coin if you got one okay um, all right because... i have a dice roller oh, okay <laughs> let me let me see uh i want you to decide if you can but otherwise if you need to flip a coin for a decision that's fine okay all right i'll just i'll roll a d4 and odds or heads and okay. evens or tails sure. guys I, I have a coin oh okay Oh, oh. Yeah, here, put in the fate of Pyrrha. Yeah, let's see what she does. Yeah, wrote. yeah, okay. So uh, so heads is going to be forthcoming and tails is going to be coy. All good, right. Good job. Well, let me fucking flip this bitch. Well, <laughs> that's tails. <laughs> so it's coy. All right. All right yeah. She's coy. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, she, she's, she's a little playful about it. She's a little coy. This game is now starting to uh, to begin. Maybe there's some irony in it, Doctor. I mean, after all, you collect parts, I mount them on a wall. Then why do we fight in the first place? If we have common, albeit disgusting, uh, interests? Hmm, that's a good fucking question. Oh my goodness. And this is how Cal leaves the hunters. I don't see a need for us to fight. Matter of fact, I don't see a need for all of this do you know, sneaking and skulking around. Do you know why I hunt, Dr. Murdoch? Please. I have experience. I mean with other hobbies, boxing, rats and dogs, bear baiting. I love it all. But nothing gets my blood up like a hunt. 
hooves roaring through the glen, the thrill of leaping over hedges, the feeling of so much power between your legs. And the fear, of course, <laughs> the fear of knowing that in an instant, the horses can buck and send you crashing to your death. But also the fear that radiates from the prey. It's a sort of pheromone, isn't it? That's why we fight. Because it feels fucking good. Then we're not so different after all, are we? And Cal's hand moves from the side of like a very gentle, very gentlemanly to kind of like the base of her back as they mm. continue to dance and move around the circle. Mm. Um, she, as a matter of, I'm gonna I'm gonna add this narration here, as a matter of, uh, I guess, display of power. In her stance, where she has one hand up, you know, up uh, holding um, your side, you can feel that she does, in fact, carry a dagger underneath her sleeve that is pressed up just beneath your ribs. Um, and she is holding it perfectly still there um, while never breaking eye contact with you. Yeah, and Cal, they Cal dance. returns it. Yeah, I they it. they dance, they All advance. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of fascination behind Cal's eyes, something, uh, something new, something, uh, different. All right. I love Almost that. a surge of confidence. Well then let's jump away to elsewhere in London. So we left off with Pira in a bad situation. You have yeah, found that situation. TM is fucking right. Jesus you have Christ. You found La Hortensia's <laughs> la lair which he has decorated with tapestries of human flesh, uh, adorned to almost give the vague abstract impression of a pie crust in the center of this empty room. And there she sits alongside a, um, a little rocking cradle with a baby in it. And you realize, you know, in the periphery, there are wires and pulleys set up and she has rigged several barrels full of lantern oil um uh with uh this place is quite literally a powder keg it is it is this it is this uh uh, uh representation of an oven um I what do you do would like to know yeah first is there any obvious trigger like is there a flint and steel that are set to be struck is there make a, a mechanism she's think, sitting on let's have this be a night move a night move plus your um let me take a look here um i would also argue that bloodthirsty probably absolutely gets in the it absolutely gets in the does this. i think this would be i i think this would be composure because it's intense concentration like you are mm -hmm. trying to like still a plus one still a plus one but you do have disadvantage from bloodthirsty that's fine actually jesus christ that's fine um hi i rolled two fives and a six <laughs> well before you before you say anything what are oh, you oh shit what am i afraid of fuck i'm so sorry okay. that was my bad so I'm... what are you afraid of happening should you be unable to uh her noticing that i'm looking for the charges oh, oh okay um that's an interesting response i think it's going to be worse than that um because I mean, it's, I don't think she's going to immediately just pluck it because if she knows, she's going to know you see it. And she, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something a little interesting here. She is going to just very gently place a cutting knife underneath the, the triggering wire. Um, this will to like give you like the psychologically let you know that you are quite literally on a knife's edge. And so like she is she's like psychologically torturing you with that kind of like. Here we are, you know, this is happening. This is coming. What are you going to do about it? So. You still want to go through with looking for the trigger, knowing that she might psychologically torture you? Good. Okay. So you what think is Pierre's afraid of that? What is the total of your disadvantaged roll? Well, if you will let me keep those two fives and a six. Yes, I will. The total is a twelve. Fucking hell. <laughs> wait, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on. I can't math. It's an eleven. <laughs> oh, you can't. Okay. It's not. I was looking at my other stat. Because okay. it's the two lowest, right? So that's the two fives. Yeah. Well, so you do you do what you intend, and you will find uh, the trigger. So you get to describe uh, what this scene looks like, and so by extension, you get to describe like what the trigger is and how it's laid out. You can kind of set that scene for us. 
So upon realizing that she cannot approach this woman at arm to the teeth as she is, or she will blow the trap and this child, this little, this life that hasn't even started yet mm -hmm. will die. Mm -hmm. um, and so Pyrrha makes a bit of a show of disarming herself. Well, no, I mean to say is like your, um, no, no, your... This is how she's, this oh, is how she's gotcha, looking. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. This is how she's looking. Great, look, continue. Um, where I, uh, she throws down first the sabers, the whip, the knife from her boot, hmm. random, random dagger she had up her sleeve, just tosses it. And as she is, she's looking around. Um, and she sees the wires and the wires and the wires and where they're all converging and where they're all coming down at this trigger point. And I just want to be hyper aware of where that wire is. Yeah, I love that. You are hyper aware of that wire. Um, as La Hortensia looks up at you um, and she just, there is a hardness in her eyes, but also a tenderness. Um, and she says, you have killed one of my boys and have sent the other away to Bedlam. This one is, your... this is not good. You've killed one of my boys. Your boy was trying to kill me. I was simply acting in self-defense. But it is... We are going to make a new family. You and him. Looking at the little baby. Either alive or cooked. We all end up as food one way or the other. I'll go with you if you let the baby go. But then you would not have both brothers. You would only have Patrick. I have another brother. Oh, but he is no good, no good. He He's is not, not the brother I have chosen for you. What if... What if I found someone better? Someone a bit more worthy than a baby? I think what you're doing here is very risky. Um, but I will allow this attempt to persuade her. Why don't you do another night move now? I feel like they're going to double stack night moves because this is a situation where it's like, okay, this is going to be plus your presence yeah. uh, with, with disadvantage because you are bloodthirsty. <laughs> what are, you're trying to coerce uh, uh, um, La Not Hortensia. To talk really out of shit. Yeah, you're trying to coerce La, La, La Hortensia to um, walk away from this dangerous situation to be alone with you leaving this infant child to be all right this is very dangerous what are you afraid of happening here should should you fail at convincing her gonna be honest i'm afraid i'm not afraid of, of the for the child i'm afraid that she is going to decide i'm not good enough anymore because then she might completely go off the rails and it's worse than that because if she kills you she will despair and cut the tripwire all at the same. Yep. There will be a loss and she will let herself roast along with this baby. I mean, I'd like her to roast. That'd be cool. So you still uh, want to give this a go? Trying to convince yeah. her? Yeah, okay. Choice was yours. Let's see what happens. Oh, this, <laughs> this is nerve wracking. Oh, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. What That's is That's a six? <laughs> Oh, okay. I might want to put a mask on, please. Well, I guess <laughs> this is the very opportunity. Yeah, but the yeah, this is here. Here's the time for the mask of the well, pig, I guess. Yeah, well, no, here's what I'll say. Before you say put on a mask, here's what I'll say. Um, if this baby dies, I'm putting the mask on. That's just happening. Well, the baby the baby dying is dependent on if you die. So what I'm going to say is here's what happens here is that the result is going to be that La Hortensia will 
attack you. She that's where this is going. She will look at you hardly and just go. I thought you were the one. I was so sure. The lady in blue told us you were so very right. But you have killed your own brother. You fought us at every turn. You deny family the beautiful life we could give you. Perhaps I was wrong. It is a shame. She pulls like the knife free and just goes, I was never good at the cutting. But at the very least, this newborn babe will eat well tonight. And she will advance on you with her one arm driving the knife forward. If you want to fight her, you may live in this reality. Otherwise, you can put on a mask to convince her to stand down. I want to clarify one thing. Yeah. She stepped away from the baby. She's away from the tripwire. Correct. In this reality. I'm fighting this dangerous. bitch. All right. <laughs> she got away from the things I didn't want her near. All right. No mask of the pig? <laughs> Maybe, depending on my next roll, but, we'll you see know. What the next roll is. All, right. All right. All right. Let's jump back to the unseen. I'm going to give this prompt to, I'm actually going to give this prompt to Pira, to, to, to oh. Shelby. Yeah. Oh, shit. Um, um, because it is very appropriate so why oh, don't is you... it bloody is it bloody and it's ridiculous quite bloody so why don't you go oh. ahead and read prompt number four there and then take it away so <clears throat> read it out loud and uh, narrate it well this is the laboratory of hallucination mm-hmm. right okay describe deck three in which the enthralled man manages to turn on the mad scientist and destroy him the final scene should be very bloody i've gotten to do both of our bloody our bloody uh play scenes now what other crew crime can i rip off of no i know um so the third act opens with another rotation of the stage the man, it, the enthralled man is snarling, foaming at the mouth, screaming at this substance that's been injected to him. He's been subjected to multiple experiments at this point. Um, and it's a scene that's written so strangely because of how sudden it is. It doesn't seem like there's a build up, there's no climax. The restraints break. And this tortured man lunges at this man's side, screaming gibberish, um, with one single word being able to be uh, heard. And that is the, I don't, has the wife's name been given yet? I don't think so. I'm going to name her now, uh, saying the name Maria. As he takes a scalpel from the from the uh, table and he disembowels the doctor and begins pulling the organs out to saying Maria as he lines them up neatly on the operating table along with all of the immaculately placed instruments Red paint is splattered across the floor. And the scene ends, leaving the audience feeling disturbed at the jarring conclusion of this tale. Very good. Very good. And as the curtain falls and the, and the crowd applauds, we cut to the applause at Brathwaite Hall as the music plays and the crowd laugh and delight and joy. Um, You've danced around with Tati, Brathwaite, and Theodora. Uh, Ross has socialized. What would our three hunters like to do at the ball, at the masquerade now? I think eventually we all kind of meet up to get some drinks. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's a little bit of food. Yeah, the party is beginning to like subside. The main dancing, now it's mostly retired to drinking and conversations on the estate gardens and balconies and um, uh, uh, chit chat. And uh, pe- some people mm-hmm. are already leaving, but the, 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 cele- the dance itself has concluded. Yes. So the hunters reconvene then, you say, for uh, with drinks in hand. Mm-hmm. The three of you are together once more. 
to look properly satisfied. Carla flips I'll give the, the key. Look. Flips the key in between her fingers. It seems that Lady Brathwaite wants to speak with us in private. Tonight. Tonight. Or the very least, she she gave us a room. Hmm. All right. If that's what she wishes, might as well go ahead and get this over with. Indeed. Does it not feel like uh, a trap, perhaps? This whole thing is a trap. Are you not worried? <laughs> Dr. Murdoch, I excel in traps. I think they never tell you me. I'm a grade A 100% efficient and highly decorated trapper and survivalist. Well, I would hope so. Or the uh, rumors about Americans would be untrue and I would be disappointed. You seem very capable, both of you. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure whatever we're going to get into is, we'll be fine, I think. She'd be very brazen to do something here with so many people, but I suppose that's why she wanted a private room. In, ev- in either case, I've survived far more dangerous women than her. At least I think I have. Besides, it could be fun. Speaking of dangerous women, I wonder how Pira's doing with traps and all. I guarantee she's having a far greater time than we are. Oh, certainly. They're screaming from the distance. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Well, um, shall we go to this room now, or once we're all together? Hmm. Maybe we'll pay her a visit upon the morrow. I will add the details that this the, the, the intention was mm-hmm. she would meet you in privately this evening. See, oh, um, it's happening okay. now. Ross well, Ross is Ross is going <clears throat> to put two hands on both of Cal's mm-hmm. shoulders and go, Oh, come on. The doc looks so eager, and if we're lucky, she might take him apart to see what makes him tick. <laughs> Not funny. That, um... <laughs> I think that would be a very fun entertainment, wouldn't you say? I hear that, you know, back in the Middle Ages. Dissections are all the rage, and they're just just talking as they're walking down mm-hmm. this hallway. I, I will absolutely say that if you do want to just like say like, oh, we'll come back another day. If mm-hmm. you want to, if you want to take the onus of rejecting the social invitation no. of Theodore Brathway, oh, we'll oh no, oh, no. Oh, no. no, this will be fun. I'm not that brazen. <laughs> okay. Um, you see that Elmore, the butler, is waiting for you as you kind of like wander through the halls of of of, mm-hmm. of Brathwaite's estate. Um, and he just kind of like leads you and escorts you to um, a gargantuan study, which for our distinguished guests mm-hmm. is the one from the very first chapter of our story. It's a little epilogue. There is a giant map of London on the wall with so many pins displayed, fully her the extent of her uh, of her um, empire of of her network, I should say, is visible here and. Uh, there is like a small, like you know, uh, desk and table where um, Theodora Brathwaite has situated herself on these, like you know, fancy divans and lounge chairs by a grand window that overlooks the estate grounds from the study. Um, you know, Elmore just kind of like stands off to the side. Um, she smiles, and there is also a gentleman sitting across from her at the table as well. Um, and 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 Theodora says, "Oh, wondrous." I was hoping you would take up my invitation. Welcome, Mr. Fontenot. I think this is our first formal meeting since St. James's. Uh, Ross is going to take the hat off, is going to bow deeply, and is going to, like, he's made his way over and he's going to gesture for her hand and hoping that she'll give it. Yes, and she'll take it. And he's gonna kiss longingly at her at her mm. fingers, and then let go, and then stand up and say, "Madam Brathwaite, you are as effervescent as you are reachful. I would say 
It is a pre- pleasure and a privilege for me to come all the way across that glorious pond known as the Atlanta, uh, the Atlantic, to take in your visage. Such a way with words, you Americans. I'm fond. Shame that Piera Rivia could not be in attendance this <laughs> evening. But where are my manners? Have you met Lord Phineas Gilday? Of the gentry. And pans over to the gentleman across the table at him and he just goes, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Can't see evening, Finney. How's it hanging? Oh. Mm. What'd you say, Meg? Can't say I've had the pleasure. Indeed, I've heard a great deal of your lot. Hmm. <laughs> Good evening, Finney. How's it hanging? Pardon? Uh, you know, sometimes when you got a horse uh, and it's and it's you know it's freshly born, it starts getting to that age where it's starting to be able to be ride. You know, get get the shoes on it, get a saddle on it. You, you got to check how it hangs. I was asking how it's hanging there. You do know a fair amount of equine husbandry, then? Ah, uh, you know, equine bulls, gators. Hmm. Uh, Theodora says, do pardon Lord Gilday. He's not one for social events like this. And he was just uh, finishing up with me. Well, I do hope we aren't intruding too, too late. It is, of course, about time for us Mm. to be headed home, but we decided that it would be in good form to just speak since you so graciously offered it is my pleasure yes ross uh can i take a measure of this uh phineas gilday uh it's what kind of what kind of man he is i just want to see what he's wearing kind of mm. kind of get a sense of him. yeah he's like know? wearing he's wearing like a fine you know like you know like suit um not mm-hmm. a, in a masquerade costume he's wearing a suit you know um he does not seem like he's too happy to be here uh, around all this revelry but he's he, you know he's kind of like he has you know tired eyes um and he has a briny smell about him um and and he, and, and and he says i too should like to see myself away for the evening mrs brathwaite thank you very kindly as for the lot of you hmm, pleasure he kind of like starts to get up and like walk away and he stops and goes Shame what happened to Chelsea recently. Shame indeed. Um, and he just kind of like strides out with this kind of like low smirking smile. Yes, terrible tragedy. All these rumors of fishmen. This is Theodora carrying on. Driving the prices of the neighborhood down. Perhaps I should buy up plenty of territory. Found Kumon Gardens. Coincidentally, yes. Hmm. hmm. What a coincidence, huh? What a, hmm. what a strange coincidence. Cal's oh. gonna. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go no, ahead. no, please go, 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 go. Cal's going to wait until Phineas Gilday walks out, uh, and once the door closes behind him. Please, I think right now we can drop the uh, vague charade of pleasantries. Uh, And he opens up a chair. May I sit? You may, Doctor. Sir Minibar. Yeah, this has a little drink cart. And Theodore looks at you, Doctor uh, Doctor Murdoch, and says, I assume your legs are so very tired after an evening on the run. I need the exercise anyway, so I'm <laughs> not too um, terribly upset. Plus, your daughter is a rather wonderful talker. Yes. She's a cruel little harlot, but she's all I have. Ho oh, oh. oh, well. ho! Ross grabs a decanter, <clears throat> a couple of crystal glasses, starts pouring brandy will work, starts pouring brandy <laughs> into some glasses. Well, I see that your air is not. Um... Perhaps your first choice? No, but she is what I have, and therefore I'm happy to, well, involve her where she is needed. But enough of 
Tati for now. Before you see yourselves out, I figured it was only fitting that we should... We should talk after all this time. It feels as if things are coming to a head. And I'd like to know from at least three of you where our businesses might lie. Hmm. Well, it seems like there's a paper trail following everywhere that we go that you've been carefully and meticulously picking up. Our four paths seem to converge to a certain point, and I think you've been watching us very, very carefully. And I'd just like to know why. The Empire needs change, Dr. Murdoch. Drastic change. Our queen imposes laws of morality that truly do not benefit the long-term interests of both the people and trade relations. I mean, you've seen plenty of violence. Can you say that the Queen's rule truly is benefiting the people, big and small? That's violence in no small part due to, if I may be once again presumptuous, your own meddling affairs. Well, Here and there. Think of what happened in France not so long ago. <laughs> Truly. Well, in that case, it was many factors. There it are. Was a, it, it was a famine, it was a lack of rain and water, and then it was, of course, the gentry taking far too much for the people. And. The when, when you have so many things together, one alone cannot topple an empire. Famine, water, and f money. Well, do we not see the poor of London starving? Do we not see the industries under the Queen's rule polluting the waters and bringing sickness like cholera? Mr. Fontenot, I'm sure you're familiar with cholera. <laughs> well, you do have an eye for picking out somebody that's seen somebody sick far too many times. And, no, uh, I will agree. And yeah. money. Indeed, taxmen take the landlord's hoard and the poor men suffer. I may be a businesswoman, but I was also one to queen myself. A pirate queen, and it is an entirely different sort of wealth distribution. Let us just say, I disagree with how our dear queen is handling the empire right now. Can the three of you truly say that you would be remiss if there should be a change in policy, in leadership, in the way things are done? Truly? No. I've seen queens and kings fall. I've seen empires crumble. I've seen all matter of people pass away. But the thing about the fall of empires, my dear Theodora, it never ends the way that people want. Violence in the streets only begets more violence. Which is why I'm avoiding violence in the long term. Yes, we've had some particular issues on the smaller scale that you've mostly found yourselves involved with, but those are tertiary to the overall plan. Let me insist, and perhaps assuay your concerns of violence. My goals are far more discreet and effective and widespread than sordid violence. I do not wish to simply kill Queen Victoria. That would be ineffective. <laughs> and when she's deposed, I have no interest in being a queen myself. No. I am capable in a different way, as you know, 
I like to weave connections, move money, allocate resources. The hard work. So you'd put a puppet on the throne? No, not a puppet. Not a figurehead. Someone who deserves the title of queen. Idolatry. Someone who will work within the same whims. Someone who has been around long enough to know what traits are most desirable in a leader. Lady Holst. <clears throat> and besides, aside from the matters of the ruling monarch, there's also the nature of intellectualism in our society, which is to say science is bloated and sensationalized. Doctors in Bedlam writing essays and articles on the most mundane of things, hysterias and mental illnesses. We're not actually treating the cause, only exemplifying the symptoms. Dr. Murdoch, you know all too well, cold rationality. <laughs> the necessity of getting things done for the greater good, for the sake of advancement. In a new the empire. People, in a, Go ahead. The people are so scared of advancement, aren't they? They are. They are. And it would take a genius, a revolutionary, such as yourself, to lead the collegiums of London to show in truth the strength of knowledge in the empire. And of course, no empire can sustain itself without trade and the men of great power like none other have seen from the West. Mr. Fontenot, you come from a reputable family, and trust me, I do not wish to thrust you into the business world, but you are capable. You can take us farther than the Empire's ever gone before. You know the West well, and I'm not speaking of worldly conquest, but come now. Wouldn't you like to see that frontier living, that honest hard work that is so lacking from the uppity Silver spoon asked gentry, if you pardon my language. I've seen similar things in Montserrat, but nothing as fantastical as the way they do things in America. I assume our dear Lady Rivia would continue on with what she's always done. The Rivia family are an old, old staple of Europe and have had many vested interests in Britannia for some time. It is true, I have sent Mr. Higgins around to Hargrave House to speak with the elder Rivia Pavel, is it not? Yes. Because this curse that haunts her family is holding them back. They deserve to flourish and move forward with an empire. Hence why I wish to help solve this problem once and for all. The Rivias are intelligent and capable and can enact countless, countless years of prosperity if given direction. So you turn us into a lapdog, a servant, a puppet in a, in a university, and an idol. I feel like we are missing perspectives here. Go ahead, go ahead, Ross. And Ross is like sat down. He's grabbed the bot. He's grabbed the decanter now, and he's just he puts his boots up on the table, and he's like, "Do you mind if I smoke?" And he doesn't wait, and he's just gonna light a cigar in here. He's gonna a smile take a curls her lips. He's gonna start making circles, and I go, "I want to circle back." A little bit to what you said before uh, you, you said that you were a queen at one point a pirate queen and you are no longer a queen i just want to clarify that 
when I had been captured by the Royal Navy and then pardoned by a much younger Victoria, I decided henceforth to make an honest living. I gave up the title willingly. I made much greater strides weaving business connections than I ever did sailing the seas, plundering. But you're not a queen anymore, is what I'm and saying. And I wouldn't wish to become one, Mr. Fontenot. Only a capable and organized hand pushing Britannia towards prosperity. I'm just trying to wrap my head... I have to let you know, I'm not a very intelligent person. I am a more charge forward and uh, ask questions later type of folk myself. Um, and I'm just trying to clarify something here because it doesn't seem that you might be the most qualified person to make these changes happen. And at the same time, you're saying things about how you're trying to make things better for the people of Britannia. Um, which I've always hated that name. Sounds like cornmeal in my mouth. But what do the people get to say about all this? Do the people ever want this to happen? Do they even know who you are? Do they want these changes to happen? Why not change how the Empire is run? For the people do have more say. Who's to say specifically what is best for the people, but all we can say with certainty is that the Queen is not best for this empire. And in She's this not? grand plan mm -hmm. of yours, we help you, and we overthrow this empire, and we become in your place some people who can help, and you would install all of us in positions of power, and then what? You trust us to make such decisions? I see no reason why we can't work together. We've been playing this game of cat and mouse for some time. Clearly you're intelligent enough to notice my trails, and I'm, well, clearly more intelligent as to keep ahead of you. But if we were working together, if we were united in our front, think of what great feats we could accomplish with a god queen, a professor, a uh, what's the, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm blanking on the word a, a a a oh a um a chancellor of knowledge, and a man of progress, grit and resolve. Like you, Miss Brathwaite, I gave up a title like that some time ago. I don't need to go into many more detail, but since you know quite a bit more about me than I was expecting, so let me be very clear. If I was interested in ruling, I'd already be there. I've decided that Hargrave House is my people, and they're the people that I want to protect. And I quite don't like you threatening the people I've decided to protect. What do you say, Dr. Murdoch, Mr. Fontenot? I think it's grown quite late. She has a point. The way that things are run, if we are quite honest, is flawed. It is um, weak, in a sense. I mean, look at the Americas. They've stepped away from British rule for a long time now. They've established their own democracy. The presidency is nothing more than just a puppet, as you said, surrounded by other people voting. <laughs> if we were to establish something new, something different, allow everyone to have a say, create a new empire of a democracy, what is so wrong with that? What's wrong with advancements in trying something new? What, what is wrong with stepping away from what people assume is taboo and embrace it wholeheartedly? I'll tell you what, I've had enough of authority getting an hour away. 
I've had enough of authority getting away with doing what they want simply because they are protected by the Queen's crown. Kingdoms and monarchies have been torn down and rebuilt before, each being better than the last. Is this not just a revolutionary change? Is this I'm, not just... I'm so very glad to see you speak with reason, Dr. Murdoch. Contrary to that of your companions, it would seem. They have a point as well. I'm not going to denounce what they're saying. I think that there's just a lot of animosity between us, and we've gotten off on the wrong foot. Call it a bad first impression. Surely that's something that we could rebuild over time. But the way that you've gone about this, if I am completely honest, has definitely turned our nose. I like what you're saying, I really do. But throwing trinkets of the dead at us as a reminder or following us around constantly, or even your oily friend, Mr. Higgins, who happens to speak only in questions, by the way, which you might want to get that checked out, threatening us, it has not made this very easy. How do we know that we can trust you? How do we know that what you're saying is actually true and that you don't want to become a queen or that you do not want to rule behind locked doors and curtains because frankly I can see two sides of the same coin hmm. what do you really want I want our dear queen brought low and I wish to change the policies of this empire, her stodgy morality, and meddling with parliament behind the scenes. We'll do away with that. Embrace a more modern and sensible society that does not care for false rules of behavior and propriety, chastity. That I can agree with. That I can agree with. I've seen quite a few things that I very much like to change. You know as well as I do that I'm well beyond these petty morality laws. They're all insensible. Indeed, indeed. And Carla Holst, if I may, I know now you are but a shadow of your former self. <laughs> With my backing, my benefactorship, I can make you live once more like a queen. You would benefit from the seeds I sow. Our partnership would yield a fruitful return to your greatness. My dear Theodore, you're right. You are very, very right in the way that these two gentlemen can't really understand. I have done many things. I've lived very long lives and I have been on the top of the world. And if I wanted to, I could do it again. There's a reason though that I stepped away from that, that I stepped away from the person that I was. And it's honestly very, very simple. I watched a lot of people like me, similar to me, with powerful men, women, and those beyond. And they used their power, many of them selfishly, and they used their power, many cruelly. <laughs> It's very funny that maybe perhaps I'm with the reviews now. They've killed a lot of the people that I used to know. And for good reason. I can't fault them for it. The reason I'm alive, Miss Brathwaite, the reason why I gave up all of that, is actually very simple. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm. And the power of a queen, of a god, corrupts so inherently 
that, well, I know myself that if I were to go back to that, I don't think anybody would like the result. Well. I'm not a good woman, Theodore. I don't think any of us in this room are good. Hmm. So why don't we drop this pretense of good? I think you're a very fascinating woman. I really do. But be it <laughs> a bit brash for me to say, I've heard rumors myself of mm, lost love, perhaps, mm. between the two of you. I am openly willing to admit it is of a personal nature. But then if you don't, if you'll excuse me, I'd really rather not be between the spat of two formal partners. There are no innocent bystanders here, Carla Host. You are involved one way or the other. Oh, I'm aware. Well, then. I'm very aware. This shall be very interesting, then. Ross is going to stand up. He's going to grab the tip canter, and he's going to pour into the crystal glass enough brandy until it gets enough so it doesn't spill over the top. He's going to sip a little bit from it, and he's going to go, no matter what you decide, Theodora, or what these other two decide, I'm uh, I'm gonna do what I can to make sure that uh, the right people get hurt and the wrong people don't. Uh, as for this little tete tete that happened between everybody, if I wanted to go to a dick measure and I would have stayed in America at a rodeo or something. Hmm. Well. Then allow me to impart a simple bit of friendly advice before you see yourselves out. Do whatever you wish, though when the time comes, do not stand in my way, and we'll all get along just fine. Good evening. Good evening. Hmm. Arrivederci. I'm going to stand in this bitch's way so hard. Think. <laughs> Cal is... Cal is conflicted. Think on what I said, Dr. Murdoch. And... People are so afraid of advancement. But, um, I hope that if we cannot agree and that we cannot come to a middle ground, then we can at least find the best case scenario for everyone involved. Hmm. And you will see yourselves out. Cool. Let's finish off this night phase by cutting over to Pira. So we cut off with... Situation! With a situation what we cut with, off with, with... La Hortensia. La Hortensia is about the fucking Drawing die. her blade, and... She lunges at you with her knife. Um... And she is going to slash across your face. New scar. Um, um, oh, yeah. All my scars peeled off already. So mm -hmm. um, just going to have to pretend slashes there's blood across there, your guys. Face. Yeah. I'm going to give you a condition. Um, and that condition is going to be called. Um, let's see. Deeply cut. <laughs> like I was before. Um. No, uh, this one is going to be, um, she cuts you across your face. I'm going to call it blood in the eyes. Ooh, not fun. Um, and, but she doesn't keep lunging at you. She sprints deeper into this complex. She's running away, guiding you deeper within. Ooh. So I know that. When I did my look for triggers yes. for, for the trick wires, they are all in They're this all room. They're all here. Do so, any, mm -hmm. But none of them lead out of the room. No. I'm trying to make sure. She might be leading you to other traps, but she is... But she is... This room for now is safe, but if she does get the better better of you, it is, this place is going up in flames when she comes uh, back. This is going to upset the baby, but I'm going to move the fucking baby's bassinet out of here. Okay, cool. Uh, Grab the baby bassinet, just fucking put it outside the room. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then chase after this bitch. All right. I ain't leaving an infant to get cooked. You Here's chase a bitch, but I'm not that big of a bitch. You chase after her. Um, and 
Um, let's see what happens. Um, you're hunting her down. This is you're gonna kill her, right? Oh yeah. Right. Um, bare I think, hands kill I, her. I didn't I, take up a single one of my weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we get into any, because she's gonna, she's trying to guide you into a trap, and you're running head first after would her. Would I? No, would I be able to reasonably suspect she's right? Me At this point, trap. you would. I, mean, I think it's like a default the bitch that, just tried to trap me twice. Yeah. I think I'd like to say I'm doing this cautiously. Okay. Then. then in that case, this is going to be a night move plus your composure with this advantage. So this one's a pretty obvious one. What are you afraid of happening here? Should you fail at being cautious? I'm not afraid the trap is going to hurt me. I'm afraid it's going to immobilize me. Mm hmm. That'll um, it, it, it'll incapacitate me in some way and it, keep me from either killing her. Or keep her from killing the baby. <laughs> yeah, she, it's worse than that because when you're incapacitated, she will drag you back and make you watch. I'm gonna roll these dice now, please. All right, um, you made 3d6 unless you can bump one of these with a uh, with an item from your inventory. I cannot. I no. Oh, okay. oh fuck. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. Uh, a mask is gonna happen. Um, because that's a four. Okay. So you will stumble into a trap. This trap is as cautious as you are. La Hortensia is prepared. And yeah. uh, what... she probably watched me kill her sons, mm -hmm. as she knows. It is a standard noose hunting trap, which is your ankle oh, gets it. yanked up in the air. I got fucking rabbit traps. Got rabbit traps. <laughs> but you're pulled into a lane out mesh of um of wire which fully <laughs> slices your legs off yeah i'd like to put a mask on <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> fuck that mask of the pig mask of the pig finally we got that <laughs> finally we did you guys been trying you've been asking me to do it for fucking weeks so i'll do it <laughs> there's a reason the mask of the pig each hunter narrates a dream about the pagan swine god Moch. Oh, did god Moch damn it. demand a sacrifice of riches, status, or blood? What did they each sacrifice? We can narrate those now, or we can uh, do that after the break. Um, I'll let you all think about it. Um, yeah. But for now... I probably won't be here after the break is the problem. So you can narrate yours now. Yeah, let's do that. Um, well, so one of the few nights Pira does not fall into horrific nightmares of the beast. Um, her dream Moch asked for blood because what else would be asked by uh, mm -hmm. of the the legacy mm -hmm. and so Pira offers up a necklace that begins to drip slowly in blood seems to just manifest from the metal it's an old coin on a leather cord. And it flows. Slowly. Mm -hmm. And she wakes up. And she wakes up. Excellent. And then that does not happen. What you do, there is a complication here when you bumped it up, but it is not such a severe result. That's not, can I keep my legs, please? You keep your legs. <laughs> um... The trap is, I'm going to say it's still the, um, a, um, the, it's the, it's the rabbit, the tra uh, noose trap. <laughs> Fucking rabbit trap. Um, so like you are hanging there, um, kind of vulnerable and incapacitated briefly in this moment as you see, um, a tall, grieving La Hortensia come charging at you. Um, um, but you have your swords. You cut I, the rope. And I, because, it, yeah, because this is a I do get to narrate the result. That is, uh, yeah, I was yeah. going to say though that I don't have my weapons. I disarmed myself. Oh, that's very, oh, that's very, oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, you are grasping at the knot as she is lumbering towards you, muttering to herself about how... This is all failed. This was you that you were supposed to be. You were supposed to replace her and join the family at Mox, suckling at Mox's breast. 
of the great he Sao joining in on the family um and you are pulling in she has um she has taken obert's knife the big long blade oh, and she is ready to gut you from midsection all the way up to your thighs fucking um, dress me out like a deer i don't dress want you up that like a deer um and huh. Do I do this or do I do something else? This is such oh, a Oh no, do whatever you were thinking. Um, I saw that look on your face and I need to know what it meant. <laughs> when you when she lurches at you with this blade, um you 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 kind of force your body to swing to the side using just momentum. You feel a deep gash in your abdomen, and you can actually feel metal against your rib cage as the knife grinds there. Um, but you use that momentum to instead uh, grab La Hortentia around like the neck, um, and it's kind of like. Um, You've seen the newest Suicide Squad movie when I have not. Okay, there's a there's a scene where uh, Harley basically strangles a man by like she's hung up, but she's using her thighs. This is like that's the reverse very, of that. This is the reverse of that. This is the reverse of that where you are upside down, but you manage you feel the knife uh, slash up against you, and you kind of like swing into her and grab her, and you hold her firmly upside down. Um, she's like reaching up and slashing and cutting at you, um, and and y you feel these bad bleeding wounds, but you use your core strength then in this rage, this boiling grief, to like like lift yourself up, kind of a, like, like cur curl upwards like on the rope. Like fucking crunch. Crunch on upward the on the rope, while like, you know, backwards headlocking La Hortensia as she's struggling and screaming, and she's thrashing wildly, and one of those knife thrashes cut the rope, and you two both slam to the ground hard. You impact against the floor, and you scrabble forward, um, and you grab the big knife that Obert used, and you just hold it aloft above your head, screaming, thinking mm. of how your yeah. uncle treated you and you just oh, yeah. stab 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 until you drive the blade fully through her a hundred times and then through the floor beneath her you huff and you puff that was an unintentional joke and then you just for added measure thrust your hand inside of her body and rip out her heart and throw it across the room. Um, you are absolutely going to get a, f a, a, a force condition marked because you would take a new condition from how badly wounded you are, but you have all your full... Actually, no, wait, hold on. Uh, gratuitous violence, you clear mental conditions, so you clear bloodthirsty. In its stead, you will now take... Um, I wasn't ready for that mask yet. So. Yeah, no, it's, no, yeah, no, actually, it's a good, I just probably, because of the gratuitous violence, you would clear the uh, mental condition, um, so you'll, uh, uh, clear I also blood have thirsty. to mark the counter, so. Yes, you do, you're gonna, gonna go mark Hunt that. X, yep, Hunt X is marked, and then what's the condition I'm gonna give you here? Eight more, guys, and then we get the beast! I think a fitting condition name for what you just went through is, um, family, matters we'll call it family matters is what we'll call this condition you know, that it's is it's less honestly... of a physical issue this is more of a you just went through some traumatizing shit the wounds are secondary to the mental the mental stuff you just went through with that sorry i just had a fucking cat reflex moment we're just gonna call it uh family matters um um okay. and, oh no, no 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 here's what i'll call it bloody reunion <laughs> is what we'll call it um, I like that one. Great. But that'll bring it. our night that'll bring our night phase to a close. And before we head off to break and therefore see uh uh shall be off, let's actually quickly uh distribute the rewards for the fixed threat, because you resolve that. Um, yes. Also, yeah. can I take the can I take the baby back to Hargrave House? Yes, you <laughs> well, that can. that is something you allow you, me to you do. Raise a baby in Hargrave House. <laughs> I'm, maybe I'll take care of him. <laughs> No, uh, no I'll, I'm kidding. I'll take the kid. I'm I'm not bringing it. This is not a pet. I'll I don't know where baby. else. I'm taking the baby back to its mother. I just need so, to find its mother. Jesus. Does it have powers? That was, like, is it cool? Like, that is it was a cool an, 
exhilarating night phase. Um, oh, and shit. Bloody oh, yeah. and vile. I, I hope believe. I hope that was suitably uh, gory for you, uh, Shelby, to conclude oh, that. Man, I, you know, I love that you had me rip her heart out because I was going to echo in the night and start pulling out organs. <laughs> good, good, good. We're on the same page. Um, okay, then we'll, we'll do the dawn phase and we'll go to break and we'll see you off and I hope you feel better. Um, so let's give out the rewards for solving Fig's Pigs. Um, there are five rewards for this. One of them is Obert's Butcher Knife, which you can add to your personal quarters, um, which is very fitting that was used there in the end. Yeah. Um, another reward is a large baking peel with the shape of a pig carved into it. Um, another one is a holy symbol of Moch. Um, and uh, you can, you can you, if you pick that, you describe it, add it to your personal quarters, and then... We get to unmark Mask of the Pig, and then you can mark it again in the future for any thread. Um, and <laughs> the, we should give to Ross to give him the another other, lifeline. Is the, what you're telling me? The other two rewards are mementos that you can assign. So I think it's fitting that we we start with uh, uh, Pira first. Which reward would you like to take from this threat? No, I'm, I think I'm having a blank here. Can I have another hunter choose my reward, or is that only for the? That's the memento. Mementos? It's like I pick a memento and you tell me oh. what it is. Yeah. As much as I would love Obert's knife, I really like the idea of mementos. Okay, yeah. Who who are you gonna pick to tell you what it is? I think Ross gave me my last one, so I'm gonna go with. Hmm. Well, now I have to fucking flip a coin. Yeah. Call it in the air, guys. Heads, tails, and with heads. All right, Jordan. Oh. What? What is? What is? What memento does Pira get from this threat? I think you got a bird whistle that was hanging around Hortensia's neck to call for Patrick. Oh my God, that's unique <laughs> as hell. I'm gonna use this in such a fucked up way. That's really cool. <laughs> I think that's what you got. That's really I'm just cool. Gonna go to Bedlam and just start blowing the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick's just gonna okay. Let me out! <laughs> Do you like that reward? I love that. Great. Um. All right. Let's have. Also, I could absolutely make that something really useful in a roll. Mm. So thank you, Cal. What do you want to take? <laughs> I'm taking over its fucking blade, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you have Obert's, You have Obert's Take butcher it. knife in your personal quarters. That's Still awesome. Still covered in Pira's blood. Have fun with that. All right, Ross. What do you want? <laughs> Give me that symbol of mo, baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, you, yeah, you get to describe what oh. it looks like. Uh, so it is a. Do you know how swine have their, how their feet look? Pigs' feet. It looks okay, like hooves. It, it, little 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 hooves. Uh, it is a dried and uh, like mummified almost pig hoof um, that uh, sits not on like a. It's I guess it's almost like a crucifix. But it's a pig's foot that sits on it's like a ring pop, but like a big <laughs> one. But instead of it fitting no, on your hand, no, I you hate hold that. It instead, yeah. Keep going. It's just it's just gnarly. And there's teeth around the rim of like yeah. the, the the thing. It just it looks fucking I need to make a, a correction. It's, it's not a pig hoof. god. Like, I need to make a correction. It's not hooved, it's cloven hooves. Ooh. Cloven hoof, yeah. yeah. Specifically. Yep. Yeah, that's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I, I love that. that. Kosher rules. Oh absolutely God. disgusting. Oh. It's like a ring thirty. Up, there's about thirty to fifty teeth. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. So many teeth. Too many teeth. Thank that's you for teeth. thank you for the teeth ring pop. Okay. Um <laughs> all right, really, really. <laughs> You just can't stop. Really? <laughs> you shouldn't have. No, really. You shouldn't have. Oh my god, it's great uh, with Ross's alligator toe. It's perfect. Hey, Pira, what does Pira bring Carla back? Because Carla did not really participate in Fig's Pigs Ooh. too much. What does Pira bring Carla back? <laughs> I know what I'm going to bring back for you. The baby was wrapped in a very nice silk blanket that I bring back to Carla. Well, thank you. 
silk. Real blanket. silk, not that fucking fake polyester okay. shit that I don't think exists here. Very uh, nice. Uh, 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 uh. All right, very good stuff. Um, we'll answer our Dawn questions on the break, and when we come back, we'll resolve some of those masks and uh, and see what happens, what comes out next here in London. Um, but yeah, you let's... You guys have a good uh, show. Mm, thank you. Uh, thank guys, you. we'll be right back, so don't go anywhere. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back, everybody. Um, okay, so let's just continue resolving the rest of this dawn phase. Um, let us... Did you guys already answer the dawn questions for yourselves in the break, or are we doing that right now? Oh, oh I thought we were going right to do now. that right now. We'll do that right now, it's fine. So then, Ross... Yep, answered a question, resolved question. a threat. Uh-huh. Uh, Echo in the night, did you experience one? I did not. I said... Oh, my, oh did I? Uh, yeah, our our suits and our colors. dresses, yep. yeah, our did, colors. Yep. Yes, okay. you did. Yep. Cool. Echo yes, you did. I, I also did try to set up the tongue thing. Just never happened. Mm -hmm. Didn't have. Did, yeah. Tongue. Oh, okay. And did you have a raw passion sexual encounter? No, you did not. I did not. Did you stick out in London society for all the wrong reasons? Yes, oh, I did. Yes, you did. That's I, I went to I went to a member of the gentry and I asked how he's hanging. <laughs> yep, that is uh, an advance for you, sir. That's four XP. Oh yeah, we are going to increase an ability modifier by one. Nice, uh, Doctor Murdoch. Yes, you answered a question. You resolved a threat. You echoed. You got an echo in the night. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have a conversation with the child? No, was looking. Yes, you did. He was trying on all the uh, all the clothes and yes, stuff in are. front of him. Did you show like physical affection Grinch. toward the child while someone else was looking? No. Nobody else knows Nobody besides else was looking. Brathwaite's. But that's still an advance for you, sir. Four XP. Nice. Okay. All right, and then Carla, you got your three. Did you create an ornate over-the-top erotic experience? I'm going to ask this of Jordan because mm. I can't answer this. Did Cal consider Carla kissing him over the top and erotic? You can answer yes or no. Man's only kissed a ghost once. So that was that was that was a step out of the out of the puddle for good old uh good old Cal Murdoch. Okay. Did it happen uh, on the dance floor? No, it, it, it happened at the funeral. Oh, that's right, it did happen at the funeral. And he immediately ran to the bathroom, so I'd say yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Fair enough. That's that, that's why I was asking. <laughs> Whether to escape the situation because he was so nervous, or yeah, he <laughs> he ran into the bathroom. Kids never yes. never get half mass at a funeral. Anyway, um, <laughs> did Carla secretly show a vulnerable side to someone? Yeah, to Cal, I think. To Cal, yeah. yeah. To Cal's mm -hmm. session. Uh, that's so an advance for you, Lady Holst. I will also just increase my ability modifier mostly because you are really uh, baiting us. Like you're you're building up to your custom move, aren't I you? I am baiting up to your, to my custom move, and that's intentional. I, is it still the ideas we talked about a I long time think, ago? I think we might still do that. I think okay. they'll be appropriate for 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 an end game move. I I think so too. We'll see where that goes. All right, cool. Um, mm. Nito. Alrighty, uh, if you would like to mark new elective dawn questions, you may do so now. Um, I think I'm going to bump my reason. If for the audience, if you know, Carlos reason has been at a flat negative one this entire time. Please do. So um, I think I'm going to up that to the zero. Oh my god, nice. Um, all right, the quickening is over now. Um, and yep, no, you, you, nothing changes. Uh, the mother, the resurrectionist, you got a part for the child and they drew no, uh, legal repercussions. Which part of the child did they return with? We are getting the lungs today. Oh, fun. All right. Well, as, the lungs. as they hand, as, uh, Harley White hands you the lungs and as you hold them in your hands, uh, what memory of <clears throat> Bigby Murdoch are, is triggered by holding them? When Bigby was found uh, and they had taken him, it, it kind of continues uh, from, from where it left off um, from the last time uh, that, that we spoke about it. Um, Bigby was on a table near death, couldn't utter a sound, couldn't do anything, could only kind of pant and breathe. Um, a pleasant memory but still sad was the peace that Bigby got when 
when he passed. The pain was over. Everything was done. He could just kind of pass on and frolic around wherever he was going to go after that. Okay. Let us now... We need five more pieces. All right. Uh, the three of you have Mask of the Pig prompts to, to answer. Um, if you'd like to do I'm, so now. I'm going to start first with one because I have two masks. You do have masks two masks. Resolved. That's very so true. So I'm going to start us off. It's not a dream. That's the first thing that's going to change a little bit from this case. It's not a dream. It was a day that Carla was walking down the streets of London. And you see her stop at an intersection. And for a moment, it's not London. And you see just the two of them mock the great he sow, towering and this swine of massive form. And her tall and regal and queen of the damned, but not so imposing as this great pig god. And for Carla, of course, he demands status. What else could one god demand of another? And so she thinks for a moment, and she does the one thing that a god can offer, because a god doesn't have very many things of their own, as it were. She kneels, and the vision drops. Mm -hmm. And your second prompt? I'll let the other two go first. Okay, good, good, good. Ross, after the ball, kind of sour on the whole evening, the, the interaction with Theodora uh, gets wildly drunk by the time from the meeting room to the carriage where they're leaving uh, and spends the whole time like a dog out of the carriage. Sorry, my cat. Uh, like a dog with his head out, smoking his cigars profusely, then turning back inside and going to say something to like either one of them about how the night went and then just bites his lip and goes back. So he's in a huff. He goes to his room, goes to bed. Easily. It's that drunk sleep. And then he wakes up in a hall, a mud floor, it's at a lodge of some sort, and it smells like burning, crackling flesh. And you see people unclothed, some maybe wearing loincloths, eating, drinking, rooting, swine-like, reveling. And he turns to the chair, and you see this giant man with a form, has a rotund belly, grease from meat being eaten, but it's not just meat, it's a mixture of rotten vegetables and other kind of filth. And he turns and he says, What says you, Ross Fontenot? I am a god that protects hunters and warriors, and I have protected you all my days. And Ross thinks to who his patron is, the exact opposite of this creature before him. But he knows that he's outmanned, he's outnumbered, and he doesn't know how to go about this situation in a more physical way, so he uses his wiles. And the god says, what have you to offer me? Ross thinks to himself, he's not a man of means, he's not a man of status himself, but he pulls out a book from nowhere and opens it up and it's a picture book. It's a pop-up book, very popular in the time. And you see the Fontenot estate and he flips through it and it pops up. And we see the textile mills that the Fontenot's own and everything. And he just takes one large look at it 
closes it and sets it before the swine god's feet and turns and walks out of the lodge. And he wakes up in a sweat, hungover as hell. Too much brandy and limoncello. Hmm. All right. And Cal. As I begin to walk out of the room uh, after having a conversation with Lady Brathwaite, uh, Cal was the last to follow out as he had given his final words about coming to an understanding and maybe finding a middle ground, the best case scenario for everyone involved, knowing that he realistically would never be able to find something like that, uh, the three of them leave. And as he closes the door behind him, he's just in darkness. He continues to walk forward. He walks for what feels like an hour, maybe, until he comes across two pedestals, one of which stands several members of Hargrave House, including a larger hulking figure behind them. And on the other side, we see Lady Brathwaite, Tati Brathwaite, and what appears to be a figure covered by a blanket on a metal table. Lady Brathwaite extends her hand and just everything begins to kind of uh, echo in his mind of, of advancement and status and becoming greater than than what he is. But he understands that his friends are suspicious for a reason and they made very, very good points. He decides to give up whatever path he was thinking about going for, steps to the pedestal on the left with the members of Hargrave House, and when he blinks, they're at the front door, just walking inside. Very cool. All righty. And I think last we have Carla's final mask, one of your masks yes. of the past. Would you mind telling us what the prompt is and then take us into it? Narrate a flashback that shows when you cruelly discarded the artist. You'll note in the last mask of the past, I was very ambiguous about when it happened. That's because this mask of the past happens as our dear members are leaving the Brathwaite estate. There's still noise at whatever ungodly hour that they're heading home. Laughter, jeering, the sounds of people making, well, the Brathwaite's known for the revelry after all. And as you see Carla walking through the front gardens, out to the carriage to take them back to London, the laughter and the shouts turn to just shouts. And the garden is back many, many years in the past. And you see once again, herself, beautiful, beautiful, fine regalia. It's old, it's ancient, but it's beautiful. And you see Aaron, dark hair again, dark eyes. A lovely young androgynous individual, and the two of them are arguing very loudly in this garden. The words don't really make sense to the viewer's ears, to your ears, but they make sense to each other. And you see them, the, the camera spinning around them, showing different artworks that Aaron has made of Carla, paintings and sculptures, and things made out of clay, carved out of stone, drawn in charcoal. And you hear the words finally, and they make sense in a language you understand. And Aaron is pleading with Carla, saying, what is wrong? Please tell me what is wrong. I don't know what's wrong. And you see Carla is distraught. She is distracted. She's looking in every direction. She's holding her head because she doesn't know how to respond. How do you respond? and say what's wrong when you've been raised a god, when you have been told that you are above everyone, you are above the feelings, you're above the feeling of being vulnerable. 
of people taking everything from you, looking at you from every angle, being this thing to be gazed upon, not to be known, not to be loved, but to be observed. How do you ab express that? How do you express that to your friend who loves you or the person who says that you're friend? She knows that Aaron loves her. She knows that Aaron cares about her, but she doesn't know how to say it. She can't say it. And in a moment of anger and in a moment of pure, unadulterated pain, she grabs their shoulder and she says, I am not your muse. And something flows from Aaron into her. You don't see it. You just see the shock on their face as Carla pulls away her hand and looks at it. And looks at the spot where she touched them. And a silence just hangs so taut that you could cut it with a knife before she closes the fist and looks at Aaron and says, I care not what you do from this point on, but you will never make something of me again. And they nod and they run. Hmm. Very good. Thank you. Alrighty. Let's move into the day phase, which will begin now that the figs have been resolved with the introduction of a new threat in London, as always. Ooh. And I deliberated on this one for a little bit, but I think I settled. This threat is titled the drowned guardian of the docks. <clears throat> Trouble is brewing along the London docks. It's been months since the tragedy of the Dawn Herald, in which dozens of unskilled dockhands, most of them immigrants, were killed in a collision that sank the merchant vessel. The wreckage and bodies have long since been recovered, the families paid a grievance, those that could be found, and the whole affair largely blamed on foreign incompetence. But, much as some investors would like a swift return to normalcy, the rumblings of angry workers over dangerous conditions and ab abysmal pay are only made worse by a series of strange occurrences which threaten to disrupt the already precarious order of dockside operations. A number of drowned workers seem to have miraculously returned, each with tales of a guardian spirit who brought them back from the depths. The bosun of the Princess Alice, the vessel said to bear some responsibility for the accident, was found mangled and impaled with splintered timbers of the Dawn Herald. Tales circulate of a nightmare lurking along the docks, a sea monster that swam inland through the Thames, or some vengeful spirit summoned through ritual sacrifices. In It, it is this which most concerns the hunters. Nim Granby, a self-taught demonologist and friend of Hargrave House, believes that these events are linked to a powerful sea demon. Whether summoned intentionally or drawn to the echoes of recent tragedy, they believe that this entity has gained power from the sacrifice of drowned workers and valuable goods cast to the depths. Um, let's see... Who of you has? I'm gonna ask this to Ross. How do you know that some dock workers have made a pact with the Guardian, offering its sacrifices for their protection? Each of these dock workers have a shared tattoo beside their left ear on their cheek. It is of, it would look almost like an anchor, but it's of a partial circle, you know, a more than a semicircle with a line through it and two dots. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, the question for this 
threat. The first one is simple. Is the entity a demon or a helpful guardian spirit? Complexity of two, and you'll unlock the next question. Sick. Oh, man. Oh, uh, did my servant bring back a clue for Sally No Face? Yes, 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 they did. Uh, let me consult the list right now. Um, I also think that some news reaches Hargrave House. You've been dancing around the, 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 the Watley camera recently. Um, you haven't been the most direct in your dealings with it. And as a result, more people have disappeared. The Watley camera has claimed more victims lately. People disappeared and strange photographs of dark entities left in their wake. Um, oh, and, man. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we it's OK. We, we, we do have yeah. eight. You have eight. Yeah. You know, I, was thinking, um, I think thinking we should also probably answer the question for Reaver's last victim today as well. We have to still dissolve that tonight as well. Yep. Do we want to solve two questions right now? Uh, I got, okay, so here's the clue you get for, from your servitor, by the way. Oh, yes, please. Um, they bring back a letter to you that, that they came across in the night. You don't know how they acquired the letter, but that is irrelevant. They acquired it all the same. This letter indicates that an unnamed doctor was recently ejected from the Royal Academy for untoward medical procedures. And then your servant will go back out into the world and continue to look for clues. Okay. All right. Um, so you're feeling like you want to answer mm -hmm. a question right out of the gate here? Let's do the Reaver's last victim. That'll take... It's a little less complicated than the Watley camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. All right. Well, I've got some ideas. Yes, please. So, we all know that Roger, beyond just being an absolute maniac and psychopath, was a clever man, and he enjoyed his riddles. Roger knew that the, that the noose was tightening that it would not be long before he was caught, especially because it was largely the other hunters of Hargrave House who ultimately kind of brought him in. Hmm. So as a sort of last challenge to them, he left behind many, many clues. The, the cipher and the postcard in, 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 in essence are one and the same. They are pointing to the same location, it's just that each one has a different detail. The postcard shows a notable, a notable landmark, which I believe Big Ben exists by this point in time. Indeed. I believe. It shows the Big Ben clock tower and the cipher after Dr. Murdoch spent quite some time deciphering the damn thing. It essentially says, Something to the effect of the bones are located within the upper part of the clock tower. Essentially, that, and it says it will be revealed at the time of his death, which in Anton's case, the body was found at approximately, you know, it was found, you know, early morning. Uh, the coroner suspects that he died somewhere around two in the morning. Just based on the other evidence in the area. Do we all agree with this theory? I absolutely love that. That was much far so like than what I had in mind. I had a thing with, <laughs> I had a thing with the Globe Theater and Shakespeare. This is this is far easier. <laughs> Get it's also exquisite i love it <laughs> i think that works for me yeah, yeah i think it's pretty solid i mean it's pretty simple uh meg do you want to be the one to roll yeah let's roll flat 2d6 flat 2d6 uh, Ooh, that's going to be an 11 an 11 all right then uh nice. your, your theory is correct you will have an opportunity during this night phase to um acquire the remains of 
Anton Pharaoh and return them to his family. Would we be able to just tell Scotland Yard that we crack the code and then they take care of it? Um, no. All right. Uh, it, <laughs> All right. Mo, mo, I'll <laughs> say. I figured out as. I'll say mostly just because uh, the the opportunity unlocked here is you resolve the threat by finding his remains and the family. It's a very personal affair of being oh, okay. all, mm-hmm. you know, if this entire threat theme thus far has been the lack of like, of like caring enough to like look into this matter. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, you see it through. Um, okay. And plus, okay. are you telling me Cal doesn't want to be there when he is proven right by the, the last unfound victim of the Reaver case? Yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I think I think his ego needs it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Mm-hmm. Then that is on the table. That is easily something that can be resolved during the night phase. Excellent. Good work, everybody. All right. Now, how about the Watley camera? Okay. Are we feeling Are we feeling <laughs> oh. confident enough about that? Or I think is... I think I I think we just have to start spitballing because everything is a weird. lot. There's, There's a, a lot. lot. We have eight clues. And you do have eight clues for the Watley and, camera. And I will remind our audience, we don't have to necessarily include every single one. Some yep. of them may be considered red herrings, but we do have to either use or explain every single one. Well, you don't you don't have to well, use every single one. You don't have to. You could leave. But it helps. It does. It boosts those numbers. This is going to be a challenging one for you guys. Um, okay. This is because, as a reminder, the question for the Watley camera for our distinguished guest listening is what circumstances will cause someone photographed by the camera to disappear? Because we've had we've had uh, Carla photographed by the camera and she didn't disappear. So what will cause someone to disappear? Um, and for our audience, here are our clues because uh, they're a doozy. They're a doozy. A vision that Carla had of a wall of hieroglyphs and the camera was carved into the wall alongside these hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. A book on the phases of the moon, a highly detailed anatomy chart, droplets of mercury, an orrery depicting the seven heavenly realms that seem to transfix the Abernathys, a photo of something, and Trent was in the background. A a photo of someone who disappeared and Trent was in the background. Journalist notes on the Society of Obscura, who then disappeared upon, you know, saying they had discovered something and the Society of Obscura was out to get them. And then the Cinnabar pendant necklace with a broken clasp. Oh, boy. Cinnabar is... That... Does that doesn't that have to do with the Martian? Well, yes, it does. Well, yeah. kind of. So, kind of. I, I read through that play, but, but as a reminder, Cinnabar is just a is an or. So, um, it adds or. Yeah, Cinnabar, mm-hmm. but Cinnabar mm-hmm. does play with the Martian. There's a whole Cinnabar play, thing yep. uh, the, because uh, of like the, the red. I mean, red planet and all that. <laughs> but yeah, Cinnabar itself is a like um, is this mercury. like bright scarlet form of mercury sulfide? Yeah. Okay. Make mercury. So, mercury. Okay, so I think... just saying there's a connection right there already. <laughs> So I think it's fair enough to say that the circumstances in which someone goes missing are extremely, extremely occult, yes. extremely esoteric. This just doesn't yes. happen. It isn't just a thing that happens normally. This is a thing that someone has to deliberately set up. Yep. I think that's a fair assumption of what's going on here. Droplets of mercury and a cinnabar pendant necklace. I've already got you right there. So the droplets mm-hmm. of mercury, the bulb that you have to use for the flash bulb for the Watley camera, you have to use a mercury bulb. Oh. That's not a real thing. That's a thing that I made up, but it ties into it. it, it I like does, it. Does, <laughs> does, I like does it. the does the flash powder have cinnabar in it? Yes. Ooh, yes. Mercury, yes. mercury bulb, mm-hmm. mercury it lays into yeah. the flash powder. Um, mer- mercury, from an alchemical perspective, is kind yeah. of a an in between state. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's a liquid metal. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense for something that's meant to transport people between realms. It's you need that kind of you know yeah okay. alchemical reagent mm-hmm. and I, I like being able to acknowledge that this is also just not some ordinary camera with like occult properties like this is something that was particularly made and kind of transcends time a little bit which is why it's in the hieroglyphs they they saw something of great power whether they flashed forward in time or for a moment we flashed back uh, mm-hmm. but that camera is very special so 
at some point, whether these hieroglyphs are, you know, Egyptian or Sumerian or any of the kind, depending on how far back it goes, there's documentation for it. It's also because this is such an occult thing, time is very important. The time at which someone goes missing is very important. That's why the Abernathy's really enjoy looking at, you know, the phases of both phases of the moon, but also, you know, they land into the planets. It needs to be at a specific time with the moon in a specific phase, and very possibly the planets have to be in a very specific alignment. Yep. I think I for think, this crew... I think the seven oh. heavenly realms refers to not... Not, not... not the stars, you think? Well, let me see. Hold on. Not planets? Well, I mean, it is... Some okay, some can relate to the celestial bodies. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's up to our interpretation. Or if it refers to the seven heavenly realms of like the divisions of the heavens, or like the Mesopotamian religions of okay, like I could I could see that you know of like the upper worlds, the um, you know like uh, I think like um, the Piranhas, like the there's like the what the Buloka, the Atala, mm-hmm. the Vitala. I don't know all the things, but like I'm saying like so. Yeah. Don't be limiting your thing that the seven heaven right. realms might be just planets. If you want to use that, fine. Totally. I love that. But if you want to have it be a little mm-hmm. bit more metaphysical, right. seven heavenly if, realms can refer to other planes of existence. Go ahead. Go ahead, go Jordan. ahead Jordan. I was thinking that that could be descriptions of afterlives of Ooh. different kinds. Like, let's say that there, you know, there is a heaven, there is a Valhalla, mm-hmm. there is an afterlife of, of every kind. And these are this is just this is just a page mm-hmm. you know this is just a page out of the book of several that are there um well i think maybe we're talking, in particular we're talking like, about the, mecha- the mechanical orrery by the way yeah yeah um, no no that, that, okay. that's what i mean okay, that it's good, like th- this is just this is just a small piece like what what like oh. they saw like mm. has so much more uh mm. say that like one in particular has been selected one in particular mm. out of those seven are is really important yeah for the camera hmm okay maybe um maybe it's thinking more like a map i guess now now here's my question for you guys because i'm of the opinion that the abernathy's probably aren't actually that evil i don't think they're malicious they're just a little weird and i don't yep. i i they're not, I don't think they're intentionally trying to send people to other realms for bad purposes necessarily. Do you know, have you ever met a swinger couple? A couple? Yeah. 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 They're like a Victorian esoteric swinger couple, except instead of just going to different clubs and things of that nature, they like to go to different planes of existence or the fragrant <laughs> void and explore. Yeah, that they, sounds like them. Yeah. That sounds like, like them. That's what I well, that's clearly what I think. they like to travel. I mean, like they they have all these oh, yeah. themed rooms, so clearly they yeah. like those vistas. I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't, well, how about, I, I, how about like they don't, they're not exactly traversing other realms, they want yes. to, they want I, I to. Think, I think, yeah. I, and I think, and that's where, and that's where the that... orrery comes into play, yeah, is because, yes. so because like, if an orrery specifically tracks the movement of bodies, mm-hmm. uh, whether that be planets or other, like, you know, like spiritual influences, like, um, other realms of existence, mm-hmm. this orrery mm-hmm. could be something that the reason it fascinates them is because it, it is tracking the alignment of these different heavenly realms, these, uh, these theoretical afterlives, or even just or what, other what, worlds. what Cyrus what some would call afterlife <gasps> Cyrus just calls other other worlds like oh my god what if the people that are disappearing are just a part of the society of Skira including the journalists including the woman who disappeared they are all part of this and they are taking the step forward to explore themselves and try to return to see just how safe this travel is. That's why there's an anatomy chart to see what it does to your body to transcend planes. The journalist was just documenting everything and walked through himself. So, so, and so instead of it being that they found me out, it was more along the lines of they found out that I've been keeping these records from them. Oh, 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 this journalist is realizing this is not what we think it is. Oh, There's something yeah. waiting yeah, for more. us on the other side. There's mm-hmm. something that is like lurking there. Yeah. It is It is dangerous. And then the society found them there and they're just like, okay, cool. 
you're going through. Like, <laughs> you you it, think it, there's it, something so through? bad? Step on the through. journalist Let's is the through. first unwilling yeah. participant so, of so being in, sent in, through. In, in, in that case, it was a oh, you want to record things? By all means, go and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that that photo of the subject is mm -hmm. in fact the journalist that got sent through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think re sorry, go, go for it. the reasons Trent there is like you said with the anatomy book, Trent's there not as like a to get rid of bodies or anything like that, or just like a member of the Society of Obscura. He was just there to check on people if they ever came back mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. to be like, are you do you have all your fingers and toes? Mm -hmm. Are you like an anatomy? How I has the fragrant void changed? I, can I, I think can I think I, oh, uh, can I add something in. Yeah, go ahead and I have a thought too. The, one of the things that the journalist, because you know, the journalist was, was going to release this to the public, that was yeah. you know, part of the thing. The Society of Obscura, yes, they put a man unwillingly into another dimension. Not something, you know, maybe normal people would do, but for them, it was a very protective act. If they didn't do this, like, what happens if, you know, if, if the journalist turns up dead? That's bad press. There, someone's going to look into this. If the journalist just vanishes, then this information doesn't get out because if it gets out, people will want to do it, and we don't know if it's safe yet. So this was the best pop possible option to make sure that things were still kept under wraps mm -hmm. as best as possible. And I, I wanted to put something forward of a reason for Trent to be there would be because he he's intertwined with the Brathwaites up until his untimely demise. I think, you know, Trent was probably keeping an eye on us the same way that, you know, Mr. Higgins was probably keeping an eye on us, same way, you know, that they've just been like one step ahead of us the entire time. He was just another set of eyes and ears mm -hmm. that were around. Once we started investigating, they sent Trent in and now they no longer have a Trent. So yeah, um, well, then wait, as, so, far, as far as the moon goes, because this is still, you know, time is very important. I think the new moon, because typically the full moon is associated with, you know, a lot of really strong magic, but the new moon is kind of more associated with, you know, things that are hidden. You don't want to, you, if you're going someplace, you know, it's called the fragrant void. Hmm. Might as well do it on the darkest night of the, of the month. Yeah. Our, it's like you close those doors to open something bigger. So just to be clear then, we're suggesting that there have been people who have returned from mm -hmm. the transition. Oh, interesting. But they all came back like different. Um, Possibly. I think maybe even some haven't gone back. Whether or well, not some that's, haven't, yeah. that's, you know, whether or not it was their decision to just not come back or like maybe one of them popped up in the fields of reeds and they're like fuck yeah man like that's well i know what's on the back. other side of the camera but yeah i, I, I <laughs> yeah, hear your thought. you know i yeah. know what's waiting out there um interesting i like the idea that you've had people who make the the journey and then they come back but they are changed in some way if not physically mentally even if it's unnoticed hence why you have trent begin pursuing human sport is like there is like the, he, this like kind of like psychosis this kind of like blood lust this desire to kill has began to begun to manifest in him i think as as a result of his excursions to the other side he is definitely not the same person you met in session one he is mm -hmm. um he is he is far more evil now people like um Penelope Levy have not returned yet, and you and and Ross mm -hmm. saw her reflection where she was begging for help. So that implies mm -hmm. that there is something wrong. Yep. And one last thing to add: the cinnabar flash powder, you know, exists, you know, for this to work. But the reason why Silas gave Ross the cin cinnabar pendant is because at least Silas believes that if you know, say, we were to try and s do this ourselves that it might help keep us safe. Maybe this transitive metal might be able to get us back. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very It's kind of like the rope to pull us back in. Hmm. Why is the why is the class broken? 
I think it's because it worked once. And he's not they sure got, it'll work again. They they pulled somebody out and it it caused if, a fracture. I have an idea. No, I have an idea. Mm -hmm. and so okay. like, what if all of the members of the Society Obscura who embark on these expeditions to the other side they wear these as like kind of that transitive thing mm -hmm. um but when they you know caught the journalist they're like all right well we'll send you through oh by the way ripped it off of his neck and then pulled the camera flash Ooh. it was like that. it, that's that's why the journalist mm -hmm. never came back uh, um, like and maybe why penelope going. never came back is that they that they don't they didn't have their necklaces on them or maybe some other it, reason maybe they didn't it, know it, yet it, it, it's very possible that, that they didn't know yet or maybe penelope wanted maybe maybe she was very brave and just wanted to see if she could you know if, since people had come back mm -hmm. she's like maybe it's safe enough that we can journey without them and that's very cool maybe she was broken proven very unfortunately wrong it's hard to tell that okay. feels good how do y'all feel really good i like, really that. Good. Um, I like that so um let me just look at this real quick um okay so like going over this the 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 camera has appeared in other parts of history because of it's like this transitive property of appearing between time periods possibly the book on the face of the moon has to do with the moon is relative to it, that also ties into like the heavenly body ori why there's a transfix on it it's because it's like oh the like the influence of these other planes coming in and out of alignment uh theoretically contributes and that's part of you know it's it's like it's that it's that ex it's it's like honing the exact like timing and like in figuring out like the stars and the and the planes and all this like all these alignment uh, factors um the anatomy chart was because they have been studying and researching the people who come back and like noticing how it affects them um that's cool the droplets of mercury are from the fact that you require uh mercury bulbs and tying that to the cinnabar pendant which has the whole like the tether and cinnabar has thus far been used as a ingredient in the flash powder as well um the journalist was sent through that was a whole thing that happened the, the journalist note specifically outlined the neck like some some dark like things that it, it, it you know stumbled onto some some things trent was involved the orrery droplets all right so i guess the specific question then that they were answering here is this what circumstances so it sounds like there must be an alignment of certain planes mm -hmm. at the at you know um, the new moon at the during the new moon okay uh -huh. um you must and use you need... the mercury bulbs and mercury flash powder um and that is what will cause somebody to disappear is what you're saying yes okay yes. That whether is... or not they're able to come back is proven but still a little wobbly this is a very fascinating theory so this is going to be a 2d6, a flat 2d6 roll um, to figure this out. Who wants to take this on? I rolled for the Reaver, so. Oh, you, oh? do you want to join? Dr. Murdoch. Oh, take... Actually, when was the last time that you made a roll? For these? Yeah, for, for like... the threat. It was a, it was a couple. Been yeah. a minute. I th you should take it. Then. A minute. I, I think, think you should. Yeah, yeah. I think was... take yeah. it. Take it. Yeah. Take it. 2d6, my guy. <laughs> take it. Shit. Let's see what happens. That is a nine. Okay. 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 There's a complication, I believe. It was like an unwelcome uh, uh, complication to the answer and or pursuing the opportunity to be more dangerous. Pursuing the opportunity is going to be more dangerous is, is absolutely mm -hmm. because you actually get two opportunities here um, oh, and nice. you get to uh, 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 you both of these are available to you you may pursue one <laughs> well actually not not you actually not not even pursue one you can do both maybe um the first opportunity is very simple resolve the threat by reversing the process and bringing penelope levy back into the world very simple you solve the missing person's case you get her back maybe she's better alternatively i think you, i think you actually can do both of these but you could you could just not do this one you can use the camera to transport yourself to the fragrant void and make contact with the entity there. Doing so will give you access to a custom move called Voidwalker. I don't know 
about y'all, I'm going to, I'm going to the fragrant void. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about y'all, I'm going to the fragrant void. I gotta pick up Anton's body or I would so be down to go with you. Oh man. Oh my god, I so wanna go. We don't we we, <laughs> we don't have to do it this next night, phase. Yep, let's go. <laughs> I want to go with the fragrant void. Yeah. I want to go to the fragrant void. That sounds yeah, fucking I incredible. Go to the fragrant void. It's fucking insane. Um. You know, well, we here's like here's Penelope. actually yeah, we can bring her home back. <laughs> Ooh, I think I'm gonna be mean. I haven't been adversarial okay. as the keeper in a while. Okay. I was originally gonna say, oh, the complication that it's gonna be more dangerous. Obviously, if you go there, pushing this opportunity, there will mm -hmm. be a lot of danger involved. I think I want to add actually instead an unwelcome complication. And that complication is if it's not resolved during this next night phase, the camera becomes Theodora's. Oh, damn it. Oh, man, I'm a void walker. You could avoid I'll... this by everyone putting on a mask and bumping it to a 10, in which case that complication will not be a thing. But I think that's the unwelcome complication. Theodora will claim the Watley camera for her own and the Watley camera will become a servant of the mastermind, a servant and it belongs to her uh, on this night because Cyrus is at her party. She was d speaking right. with the Abernathys. Mm -hmm. She was, uh -huh. it, she, it's going to enter her possession uh, if oh, you don't resolve it. Man. Now, so that either means that mm -hmm. You either Y'all. let the Reaver fall by the wayside or one of you goes off and does that while the re someone else does this. But the choice is yours. You can either all put on a mask and the mask of the pig does count as a as a viable mask use, which which is since it's been reused now, mm -hmm. it's, it's unlocked again. Um, and I think, no, we've used the mask of apathy. Never mind. Um, yeah, and the apathy. mask and the Watley camera does not have its own mask. So All I know right. this is so, hey, this is indeed an unwelcome complication because this is putting you guys in the mm -hmm. hot seat of thinking oh, of, okay. of so that, what yeah. do you let's, want? Let's, let's start discussing. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. I think ultimately, because uh, I'm OK with putting on a mask, I have a lot of masks to spare. Or, right. Well, I'm actually I'm, I'm starting to run out like, like I'm starting to, to kind of reach that. You're point. running out. <laughs> He's running out. He's... But I was, I was getting there. So it's like ultimately, you know, you got this mask of the pig, and it, it's a freebie. You know, like it, it is. This would definitely save you out of any situation. Um, you know, if you fail a quickening roll again, you're like you, you are, you're, you're shipped out. So that that's kind I of. Got, like I got two experience. more masks of the past. Okay. Yeah, but that. Oh, you, <laughs> so if, scary. if, um, it, it, it's, it, it's up to you, Wes. And you know, the reason I'm, I'm going so hard on this is because I'm like, you know what? One of the one things we haven't had experience with in these threats is addressing the states of what happens if you kind of ignore the threat and mm -hmm. the Wiley camera yeah. has him as pursuits so i'm like oh, okay cool some more people are disappearing one of the things it says is it might even become the property of the mastermind and i'm like uh -huh. oh you know because we haven't because you guys have been largely on top of it i'm gonna make this one real fucking hard for you by yeah. giving you a choice yeah. um so uh, you discuss and i'm putting on a mask but I think it is. I am. Uh, comes look, down to you. You know what? You know what? You know what? I am perfectly okay with pulling that mask of mock, mm -hmm. if it means that Jordan not only gets to do the Reaver body because we know that that's mm -hmm. a big deal for Jordan, but also that Doctor Cal Murdoch gets to come along to the fragrant <laughs> void. You don't have to come with us. That's true. You know, I I did not. That's do another a lot thing. Of... Is that is that if you yeah. Yeah, I did not do a lot of work for the Watley camera. Like mm -hmm. I was, I was focusing on other things that were there. Um, on a second thought, I would much rather have Ross Fontenot alive mm -hmm. with a saving grace. Tell, uh, I, rather tell, than I have, I have lots of things I can burn. Yeah. I will be at least safe in the fragrant void to a certain extent. <laughs> I think that we can do without Cal Murdoch going to the Fragrant Void as much as I don't even know what the fuck Void Walker does. It just seems really cool. Cal doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. Um, say I'll take care of the Reaver situation tonight. Y'all head there. We save our masks. 
Ross can live to fight another day. All right. So you're gonna <clears throat> you're gonna let this uh all right. No, we're, gonna, we're gonna let this ride. We're gonna let, ride. Gonna let it ride. Okay. That I'm elated because that was a very good way to you guys okay, that's your choice. I love the tactical. No one can ever say that there isn't player choice in a game like this. You there is absolutely player yeah, choice. This game is like nothing yeah. but player mm. choice. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> So, so now I have to ask Wes, is Ross going to go with the Fragrant Void, or is he just going to stay on the outside and do the ritual to just pull Penelope back in? Uh, you know, uh, as much as I would like to go to this Fragrant Void with you, I think that you need a person on the outside that's going to be able to pull you back if need be, or do something. Crowd control. Let's just call it. With yeah. crowd control t- tattooed on his knuckles crowd and then could c-o-n-t and then c-r-w-d c-n-t yeah and then there's like an l-r that's kind of like mixed onto the pinky c-n-t-r-l yeah grappling ross fontenot is going to be there to grapple some weirdos if he needs to okay Okay. If this okay. is the if this is the choice you guys want, you the players want. It is the yeah. choice, the choice, that, we the the choice that we want. Okay. I think that's very good. <laughs> um amazing. Then uh yeah, if you don't res- if you don't and this is the best part, if you don't resolve the threat during this night phase, it becomes the Adoras. So you can go to the fragrant void, you can have all some things. If you don't resolve it, the camera becomes Theodora's. So, and, and again, a- just one more time. What are the conditions for resolving it? So we bring back Penelope. So the, and the then... two opportunities you have is you just you resolve the threat by reversing the process, which will bring Penelope Levy back because she is kind of like an innocent. Mm-hmm. I mean, she she may have been she is still an innocent in this somehow, even if she chose, like she was manipulating. There's, there's something wrong. The threat is resolved by reversing the process and bringing her back. The opportunity to go to the void yourself. It has nothing to do with resolving yeah. the threat, but you can maybe do it on the other side, yeah. or maybe it's up to you. But point yeah. being, it's... if you want to go to the Fragrant Void, you can. It's dangerous, yeah. so, but you so, can. So basically the idea is that if we're doing this, Carla is going in possibly to look for Penelope alongside, you know, meeting with dark entities and maybe doing something there too. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Okay. We happy? Right. We good with that? I think we're happy with that. Okay. I think we're good with that. I think on that note, then we shall leave off for the evening. That is a very fascinating place to put a a, a pin in this chapter. So we will return, uh, I believe next week we might be down a no we, you're not, we're not down you next week are no. you Nick? okay you're done. No. Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Then we will probably have the full cast assembled. Mm-hmm. Then we will be back. Uh, where the heck are my glasses? There they are. Um, all right, I'm very excited to see what plays out during the state phase because I mean, on top of the Watley camera resolution, you also have Sally No Face. You also have um, the Drowned Guardian, the Docks. Now you're going to resolve Roger the, or the, the Reaver's last victim. You're edging extremely close to the Mastermind threat. But uh, until then, distinguished guests, we will see you next week, same time, same place for Chapter 13, Lucky Number 13 of the between until then my friends sleep well and rest easy for the night is dark and full of terrors good night